Welcome to The God Culture, where we urge you to challenge tradition as 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We do not intend to be confrontational, though we will defend our positions, but to compare what the Bible really says versus the traditions of men, which Yahushua Jesus himself rebuked. Yahushua said to the Pharisees, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, Yahuwah, that ye may keep your own tradition. Mark 7, 9. About a year ago, the internet rage getting millions and millions of views was all about the September 23rd, 2017 prophecy, which was being proposed as the fulfillment of Revelation 12, all interpreted through the lens of, well, actually, astrology. Some were saying the rapture was going to happen. Well, if you were watching this, guess it didn't. Some were saying it would mark the beginning of the Great Tribulation, yet again, didn't happen, did it? Over a year later, we would all know if we were in the Great Tribulation, that's for sure. The basis for this interpretation of Revelation 12 is the use of astrology, basically through the use of Stellarium software. And many fell for this one yet again. And we have fallen for some of these too, like the Shemitah, which also didn't happen. The Shemitah's theory, as far as the root, was really Kabbalah. And the claim that Yahuwah caused 9-11, which is really what it was claiming at its core, yeah, that slipped past us too. Absolutely ridiculous. We know We didn't catch that at first either. And this Revelation 12 prophecy interpretation that was being pushed on the world, which didn't even happen, thus false, really has its origins in the occult, in Kabbalah, in astrology as well. The question is, though, is Revelation 12 to be interpreted using constellations of pagan gods? I mean, and is that even, this alignment that was to occur September 23rd, 2017, and the alignment sort of did, but the event did not, was it even a never-seen-before event in all of history? Well, no. In fact, it had happened two years previously. So, no, it, it wasn't even that rare of an occurrence necessarily yet. People seize on these things all the time to scare us. They're doing it even now, and there's always another new prophecy, new theory. And many of them, many of them, really meant to scare us all. Let's test this interpretation with the Bible. See, anything that you hear, anything, even if it seems to start with Scripture, Take it back into Scripture and make sure that they didn't deviate far away from it. Because really things should be interpreted with Scripture and you should be looking at it again to make sure it actually matches. Why do we say this? Well, on this channel, we've uncovered things like uh, many folks out there claiming to have found the Garden of Eden in Iraq because... Well, they start to use the scripture in Genesis 2, and they'll read it, and then they'll just ignore every description there that the Bible offers for those rivers and their locations. Just completely ignore them, because you have to in order to espouse their theory. And this is the kind of thing that we're seeing all the time, and we need to test it and reject it if it doesn't fit. Now, this is a re-release updated because of the dating. There were some things that were updated, of course, because this was released prior to September 23rd, 2017, initially. We're re-recording and expanding this as some criticized the what was the second video, the next part, that maybe we didn't prove it out the same way that we do other things. And we felt that to be fair criticism because due to the timing, we were trying to get this out for the September 23rd supposed coming event, which didn't happen. And because of that, we took this down for a while, 
and we've been working on it behind the scenes, uh, expanding it, testing it further to see if it truly passes the test. And now we are re-releasing it because we feel it does. In case someone is not quite paying attention, and we seem to get this, at least in comments, rather often, we disprove the September 23rd event happened, even from the beginning, over a year ago, before the event, we were debunking it. We were saying this is not going to happen. We do not support that prophecy, nor did we, though we got several comments from, I don't know, maybe trolls who didn't actually watch and just assumed that we were propagating that prophecy when we were disproving. Well, some will probably do that again. Then in our next videos, we are going to blow your mind because we have unveiled an interpretation of Revelation 12 that we believe extremely appropriate and well supported scripturally and by history and we're going to lay that out in a much more detailed fashion if you saw that before that was really a brief of it but we are going to really prove it out and well this is going to make you go, well, you might react like this. Yeah, like that. First, let's go through this systematically. Revelation 12, 1 through 3. This is what is being used for the most part in propagating the prophecy theory online. And there appeared a great wonder. The Greek word for wonder is usually interpreted as sign 50 times versus 3 times as wonder. Why not use sign? There must be more to this that simply looking at the night sky perhaps doesn't address. Hmm. In heaven, the word for heaven is translated as heaven or heavenly over 1800 times. Or it could mean sky, but only five times was it translated that way. So it does mean sky in other passages, but the translators chose heaven here. Why? Let's continue. A woman, or also translated as wife or bride. That'll sound familiar. Clothed with the sun. In Greek, helios is sun which in two of the translations actually means east. Hmm, interesting. And the moon under her feet, we'll explain. And upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. No, not like the pagan goddess on the Starbucks cup, <laughs> if you're familiar with that one. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. Why would a constellation travail and pain? Does that really fit? Well, we'll get into that. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Now, this first three verses here is where some are attempting to interpret using the Stellarium software, which charts the stars and makes projections based on their courses. However, Stellarium and even scholars today are missing something huge in interpreting Yahuwah God's Word, and we'll show you. What are modern constellations? Basically, someone decided to connect the dots, kind of like when we were children and you, well, anyway, you know, in the night sky to form figures. But who did this? And what figures did they draw? And is there a connection between these supposed star patterns and Yahuwah God's interpretation of the sky? Or... Are we all basing our interpretation of Bible prophecy in modern times on a false system 
in the first place. For instance, let's look at the constellation Virgo. Here is an illustration on a deck of constellation playing cards of Virgo. So let's connect the dots on the right. Do they actually look like they form the figure of an angel? Perhaps. Can we look at it any other way? Kind of like when we look up at the clouds and the husband sees a girl, but the wife sees a peanut. Is it really much different? For instance, could it be a crab? Or, I got it. This is a prophecy in the sky of the rabbit ears TV antenna. Of course, that's silly. And yes, we do mean to mock, because you can connect these dots thousands and millions and trillions of ways. In fact, this is just cherry-picking some of the stars within the constellation's star field. You could probably form just about anything you want. But see, those who formed these patterns, oh, this is what they wanted. So the whole thing is subjective because it's a religion, not a science. Oh yeah, and who was Virgo? Virgo is one of the constellations of the zodiac. Its name is Latin for virgin. Which virgin? Well, not Mary. And we'll, we'll show you. According to the Babylonian Mul'apin, which dates from 1000 to 686 BC, over 600 years before Mary, remember that, this constellation was known as the Furrow representing the goddess Shela and her ear of grain. One star in this constellation, Spica, a spice girl, kidding, retains this tradition as it is Latin for ear of grain, one of the major products of the Mesopotamian furrow. For this reason, the constellation became associated with Fertility. Now, that's not fertility in terms of having children as much as it is sex. Let's be clear. The Babylonians associated this constellation with the goddess Ishtar. Easter is how you actually pronounce that. Hmm, look into that. Also known under the name of Ashtoreth or Astarte. Also known as Isis, which is no coincidence. And yes, we see those names in the Bible as the ancient goddess, the ancient harlot of Babylon, whom Yahuwah hates very clearly. His words are very clear. The archaic Greeks associated Virgo with their goddess of wheat and agriculture. Again, same thing, fertility. Demeter who is the mother of Persephone and Proserpina. And the association persisted through the classical period. The Romans associated with their goddess Ceres, Roman mythology. During the Middle Ages, Virgo sometimes was associated with, uh-oh, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Hmm. Now that would be the Catholic Church, of course, that did that, and what a horribly unbiblical doctrine that is. I mean, we just showed you the origin is this ancient goddess, and you're now going to, well, just give Mary their name, and, well, just make give her a constellation too, because why not give her all the attributes of the ancient goddess? Are you kidding? See, that constellation was Christianized, right? I mean, after all, it's the virgin wrong virgin. It is the ancient supposed virgin goddess of fertility, which we have been showing you over and over. She is from the pagan pantheon, far predating Mary by thousands of years. But the fact that that was being called Mary in the Middle Ages tells us that the Catholic Church associated the Virgin Mary with the Virgin 
is Star Easter, Isis, Semiramis, all known as the harlot of Babylon. Now, we're not calling Mary that. The Catholic Church is giving her her our attributes, which Mary hates and rejects vehemently. Now, that was even back then, and that is truly sad and simply biblical ignorance. No one would do that unless there was some odd agenda behind it. And man, is there when it comes to the Catholic Church. No, Mary, the mother of Yahushua, Jesus, is no harlot. And she would be disgusted at the affiliation of her name with that goddess which precedes her by thousands of years. So she was fully aware. And by the way, she was a virgin when she conceived Messiah, yes. But she had other normal children after that. From her marriage, with her husband, at least five of them, and she was no longer a virgin. So the term ever virgin does not belong to Mary, nor is it biblical, but it is the title of the ancient goddess. They are attempting to associate with Mary wrongly and really evilly. Now, we're talking about the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, not the average Catholic who does not know the difference. They're being ingrained into this control system, and this control system is lined with the leaven of the Pharisees, with Zoroastrianism and Mithraism and Kabbalah, which are all three the same thing. And that's what you're seeing in this very instance. And by the way, the fertility goddess wasn't there to help you have children. She was known for sex. She was the consort or harlot of the other gods. That was her role, and that's despicable, and certainly not Mary. She called herself a virgin when she was no virgin at all. It is disgusting to make such an association. Like Mary would want anything to do with that, nor her titles of Queen of Heaven, which Jeremiah writes is that ancient goddess 600 years before Mary, the mother of God, another unbiblical title also with roots in the ancient goddess long before Mary existed in ever virgin we covered. None of these are Mary, and yet they are doctrine, dogma, in the Catholic Church. How does that happen? Because the Catholic Church has no basis nor foundation on the Word, and that is fact. The core doctrines of the Catholic Church are pagan and originate in the pagan religions like Mithraism, Zoroastrianism, Kabbalah, also known as the Babylonian mystery religion. They're all pretty much offshoots of that one and the same religion. And each of these embraces the Babylonian astrology, all a part of the same. But we should not especially, when we know its root, embrace astrology nor any of those religions. And even if you're Catholic, we encourage you, test these things. Don't take what we're saying at face value. No, 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 no. Test it. Take every doctrine and test it with Scripture. Find it in Scripture. Not some stretched, contrived, you know, maybe that might be... No, 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 no. No, if it's doctrine, it has to come directly from Scripture. It has to be confirmed at least two to three times. And it has to be accurate with Scripture. And if it's not, throw it out. And unfortunately, you'll find there is much in the Catholic Church, if you tested it, if you actually did your due diligence, you're going to find there is much in there that you're going to have to throw out because its origin is paganism. Its origin is not the Bible. And it better be because if it's not, it has no value whatsoever. And Yahuwah, God, rejects it. Wikipedia says the origin of the earliest identified constellations likely dates back to prehistory. That'd be before the flood, when they may have related to beliefs, experiences, creations, or mythology. Likely, we would agree. 
and we will prove this out further in this video and show exactly where it in fact does originate. And you might be surprised. The Babylonians were the first to recognize that astronomical phenomena are periodic and apply mathematics to their predictions. So this came from Babylon. Keep reading and you'll see this is documented at least before 1000 BC. The Greeks adopted the Babylonian system in the 4th century BC. Even the Greek pantheon of constellations originates in ancient Babylon. Remember that. Here is a Babylonian cylinder seal dated approximately 6,000 years ago. No, we do not believe the date, but ancient nevertheless, from ancient Samaria or Sumer, Babylon. Whether the dating is 5,500 years or 4,500 years or whatever, it's really old and precedes the days of Abraham, and that's what is important as a marker here. These are basically Zoroastrian magi who are astrologers. Yes, astrology is part of their doctrine. And yes, they do look oddly familiar to rabbis, don't they? Hmm, not going to cover that in this video. We have zoomed in on the portion above the head of the astrologer. Does this look familiar to you? Are we looking at the origin of theories of the likes of Copernicus, Galileo, etc., thousands of years before they existed? How did they know 6,000 years ago or whatever that the sun was center of the solar system with planets revolving around it? And they even knew they were spheres, balls. Hmm. Babylonian history does not generally support this as an empire-wide belief, by the way. So, this is an elite, secret society represented in this seal. This is their secret knowledge, not that of the Babylonian people. This drawing was clear, but we don't hear much about it, do we? And how about the planets? How many are there? Well, they essentially show nine planets revolving around the sun, with two others much further out. How many planets are identified today? Well, it was nine, but we are now being told that Pluto may not actually be a planet, so maybe eight, whatever. Though science has no such telescope to view Pluto in such detail, so they still do not actually know. But fine, we'll give that to them. But it was nine for all that time, and it goes all the way back to this cylinder seal. Imagine that. Now, what are the other two? This is where theories like the planet Nibiru, which is also based on ancient astrology, not the Bible, and it's a Nephilim story of the home planet of the Anunnaki, or fallen angels, the Watchers, who fathered the Nephilim. Not scripture. Scripture is not the origin of the planet Nibiru. It's the home of the Watcher Fallen Angels, and it's the prophecy of their return, which, by the way, doesn't happen according to scripture, because they are locked away at the time of the flood until the day of judgment. Yes, Apollo is loosed, that is true, and that's scripture, but the other Anunnaki or Watcher Fallen Angels are not released until the Day of Judgment, and that is to face their final judgment. That is a massive distinction. Now, we keep being told this planet Nibiru is turning, yet, returning, yet there is not a trace of it whatsoever anywhere. If a planet that large was close, we would see it with the naked eye, and at least with uh, high-powered uh, camera lenses now and telescopes, and no one's seen anything. And we would feel its effects by now as well if it were that close. Now, we believe it to be just more hype because it fits the alien agenda, which is also a false narrative. Why is this so messed up? 
Well, because the author of confusion is Satan. The Bible is clear that the ancients believed in basically a flat round disc with a dome ceiling, the firmament, set on pillars with four corners even. Now, even science and history agree with that as the ancient cosmological belief system of the writers of the Bible and most of the world, in fact, all the way up until around, say, the 15, 1600s or so. However, the most ancient of cults after the flood, the Babylonians, this secret society on the cylinder seal, who were judged by Yahuwah God at the Tower of Babel, according to this cylinder seal, already believed in heliocentrism. You know, the sun is the center of the solar system. And sphere planets, orbiting thousands of years before modern science embraced this religious belief as fact. Now, we're not weighing in on the flat earth debate. We are not a flat earth channel not one of our topics but in ancient times that was the lay of the land as far as the ancients knew and don't let anyone tell you different our desire here is to be biblically correct and that is what matters and when you don't understand that fact then many times it's very easy to misinterpret the bible we're not saying which is correct but we are correcting history, which is being misrepresented by some scholars, even some from Hebrew University. By the way, modern science did not discover Uranus till 1781, Neptune till 1846, and Pluto 1930. So again, this illustrates there was knowledge that was either lost or suppressed or, hey, better yet, held secret, which is actually the case. Some secret societies have had this Babylonian knowledge all along, but let us be clear. These are Kabbalists, Freemasons. All of those have the same root. They originate after the flood in Babylon. And we're going to show you this very root. Their very same doctrines are the same as you see in Zoroastrianism. And they're the same as the Zoroastrian priests that you see carved on this cylinder seal. And it is their belief system, which is the root of just about all religion today. And unfortunately, not the Bible, which very little is centered around it and most everything deviates from it. Now let us look further into the roots. First, let's see what the Bible says about constellations. In Psalm 147.4, David writes, He telleth, Yahuwah God, telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Is it a surprise that Yahuwah God knows the number of the stars and calls them by their names? Of course not. The stars declare the glory of the Lord, Yahuwah, Psalm 19.1. He even knows the number of every hair on your head, or the lack thereof for some of us men especially. Does this indicate that Yahuwah God ever categorized the stars into constellations, however, especially ones with the attributes of pagan gods. That's really stretching it. This text does not say anything about names of groupings of stars, but individual names of each one. The other scripture used to supposedly prove the Bible discusses and endorses these constellations is Job 38, 31, and 32. Canst thou bind the sweet influence of Pleiades? Well, wait a minute, that's a constellation. Or lose the bands of Orion? Well, well, well that's a constellation. Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season? Well, only Kabbalists think that's the zodiac, otherwise that's not a constellation. Or canst thou guide Arcticus, 
another constellation, with his sons. Well, don't know about that part because that's not associated with the constellation. For the sake of time, we are not going to read the entire passage where it describes an earth that is fastened foundations. It has a cornerstone. Morning stars are singing angels, also known as sons of God or B'nai Ha Elohim. Funny, heard that one before. Aren't those the sons of Seth? Hindipo, no. Did you know the sea has doors? And wait till we tie that into this passage in Revelation we're covering. It also says the sun rises at the ends of the earth. Sound familiar? For those of us who followed our Solomon's Gold series, that's Ophir, Philippines, the ends of the earth, the ends of the ancient river from Eden system. How did Job know the sea or ocean had springs within its depths? Because this passage says that. We didn't discover hydrothermal vents at the very bottom of the deepest places of the ocean until 1977. How did Job know that? Waters are hidden as with a stone. (laughs) It's all in Job 38, so check it out. Go read it, and we'll cover that another time. In the meantime, is the Bible endorsing the constellations of pagan gods here? Well, it looks like maybe it is. Maybe. If these are the accurate words, Pleiades, Orion's Belt, Arcticus. We'll discuss Maseroth separately and last because it's not a constellation name. But do these names actually exist in the original text? Or are these translations And they've been replaced, kind of like when we covered the river from Eden. And you see in the King James Bible even, and in modern translations, you'll even see Tigris and Euphrates in there. Huh, funny. The original Hebrew does not ever say Tigris nor Euphrates. It says Hidekel and Parat. And they don't equal Tigris and Euphrates. So someone's been playing around with something. But the good news is we can find it. The word Pleiades is not used. It's the Hebrew word kaima, which simply means seven stars. Now, what seven stars is this talking about? Now, it's then assumed by scholars that this must refer to the Pleiades constellation because, well, it's known as seven stars, although it has many more than seven in its star field even. So is it seven stars? No, not really. But okay, even if it is, is it the only grouping of seven stars out there? Well, actually, not at all. Of course, there are far more than seven even in the star field of the Pleiades. This is a bad translation replacing a Hebrew word, which is not referring to a constellation, as the Pleiades. But Yahuwah God never mentions that he interprets the sky by the Pleiades, ever. And this does not either in this passage. He does mention the significance of seven stars, though. The first time that many have seen it is in Revelation 120, where the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, or ecclesias, really. However, this doesn't fit this passage and is a future context as well. But notice the parallel the passage draws as Messiah says himself. The seven stars are seven angels. In other words, stars can be angels. But there is another reference to seven angels from Enoch that gets overlooked, and more importantly, they fit this perfectly in this passage as they are also bound, which is important, especially since how are stars, we are told, suns, bound? Really? How do you do that? That would be odd in a weird way to denote basically suns being bound. Odd. First, though, notice the description in the translation here. It says, canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades. Again, it's not Pleiades, 
but the seven stars who are bound. How do we know? Yahuwah is challenging Job in this passage. Are you strong enough to bind seven powerful angels as I have? This entire passage is a display of the powerful might of Yahuwah, not about constellations. The other key is sweet influences. Now that's really an odd translation. Look at the Hebrew word used here. The word used in the original is madana means bonds or bands. When you add this to the seven stars, or angels really, you begin to understand Yahuwah is saying, Job, can you bind the seven powerful angels as I have? Of course, the answer is no, as it is to every question in this passage in Job, demonstrating the might of Yahuwah. That's what the passage is about. Now, one must really wonder how you get sweet influences as a translation for Madonna. But you know this word. This is used as another name for the Virgin. You mean Virgo? Yes, actually. And Mary, even. Another tie to a constellation, which is not in the passage at all, nor does Mary in any way associate. Sweet influences makes no sense here when the word means bound, does it? Someone's been toying around justifying astrology, inserting Kabbalah and Babylonian doctrine into the word. That's what's happening here. And the Mary doctrine and neither are expressed in this passage, though in Hebrew, it is clear, this is seven bound angels. And who are they? Well, is there a reference to these angels? Actually, yes, there is. And now, this will make perfect sense. Book of Enoch 21, 1 through 4 and verse 6. And I proceeded to where things were chaotic. And I saw there something horrible. I saw neither a heaven above nor a firmly founded earth, but a place chaotic and horrible. And there I saw seven stars of the heaven bound together in it, like great mountains and burning with fire. Then I said, For what sin are they bound? And on what account have they been cast in hither? This is the center of the earth, by the way. Uriel, the archangel, answered Enoch and said, and this is verse 6, These are of the number of the stars of heaven, which have transgressed the commandment of the Lord, Yahuwah, and are bound here till 10,000 years. The time entailed by their sins are consumed, consummated. These are seven angels that had been bound for 10,000 years. Before someone assumes this means this text is saying the earth is over 10,000 years old or the day of judgment couldn't happen for 10,000 years, note it does not say these are part of the watcher fallen angels and they are already bound during Enoch's tour of heaven Yet the watchers haven't been bound yet, and the flood has not occurred yet. They may have to be bound for a few thousand years, even beyond the Day of Judgment, because it does not say they are being judged further, necessarily. But we don't know. Once their sentence is complete, it appears they will be freed. However, Yahuwah is expressing his strength in Job in mentioning these seven stars whom he bound, which is the case with all of these, and you will see. Orion. The Hebrew word used here is kesil. I know we said it wrong. Name of a star or constellation. According to many of the ancient translators, Orion, which the Orientals call the giant. 
They seem to have looked on this constellation as the figure of an impious giant bound to the sky. Whence, Job 38.31, Canst thou loose the bands of Orion? We must not interpret the scripture as though it countenance fullest superstition. Forget Orion's belt. This is Orion's chains as he is imprisoned. This is talking about an ancient titan or giant offspring of fallen angels and watchers who is imprisoned perhaps in the sky. But why would the author have to make the statement that we must not interpret the scripture as though it countenanced foolish superstition? Because the giants were real, and Genesis 6 really happened. Is this specifically Orion, though? It is assumed, but not there necessarily. Once again, Yahuwah God already named the stars before this point in history, and he would not rename them for a fallen angel or their evil offspring. This Hebrew word is found in Job 9, Job 38, 31, and Amos 5, 8. It is interpreted as Orion each time, but we challenge this because it's just not there. This is not a reference to Orion's belt. It's a reference to a chained evil giant, Nephilim, who venerated the ancient giants and fallen angels, not Yahuwah God, but almost all religions do. Articus, again, is not used here. The word is Aish, which means bear. Even Strong's then jumps to the conclusion that it's the Great Bear constellation, but this is really not supported. What is supported further in the definition, though, is that this is the word in Arabic for night watcher. You mean like watcher fallen angel? Hmm, perhaps. Could that angel or his offspring have features of a bear? Very likely. Or could this be a reference to the imprisonment of this fallen angel or his offspring as the other two are? This reference in Job is not a reference to constellations by Yahuwah God. When you read the entire passage, it is a reminder to Job of Yahuwah God's strength and might from Yahuwah himself in answer to Job's supplication. He is pointing out the watchers whom he imprisoned easily and challenges Job can any man free them? Job knew the answer was no one could. He knew Yahuwah God was and is sovereign above all. So let's look at Maseroth, though. Remember, this definitely is not the name of any constellation even today. So what exactly is it? Maseroth only appears this one time in the entire Bible. Here's the definition we are given by Strong's Concordance. The 12 signs of the zodiac and their 36 associated constellations. There we have it. It must be constellations, all 48 of them. The zodiac, right? Did we see that with any of these other references? No. Wikipedia says the word's precise meaning is uncertain, but its context is that of astronomical constellations. Well, if it's uncertain, how do you know that? Uh, just our take on it. And it is often interpreted as a term for the zodiac or constellations thereof. By whom? See, this is assumed. They do not have such a connection. In Yiddish more Wikipedia, the term Mazalot came to be used in the sense of astrology uh, in general, surviving in the expression Mazel Tov, meaning good luck. So I'll never use that word again. 
And now an even bigger disconnected, though. Yiddish is not Hebrew, nor does it originate in Hebrew. It is a Turkic language, and if Mazel Tov means good astrological luck, it is Kabbalah, not from Yahuwah God. Who doesn't wish people luck? But that is a normal language of astrology. In Kabbalistic astrology, Mazalot, 2 Kings 23.5, was also used for astrology in general, and the word may be related to the Assyrian. Oh, there it is. It's a Kabbalistic interpretation, all right. But this uses a scripture from Kings, so let's review that scripture just real quick. 2 Kings 23.5 And he put down, killed, destroyed, the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem, them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the Mazalot planets, and to all the host of heaven. So we'll give scholars this one. It may actually refer to the zodiac, perhaps. In this case, planets. Also, planets and stars are the same thing in the Bible as there is never any differentiation between the two. But what context is being used here? In this context of those who worship Baal, and Baal is from, he is the deity from Babylon. What does Yahuwah God do to the practices of Baal, to those idolatrous priests? He destroys them. He kills them. And often throughout the Bible, you will see that same theme. He does not tolerate them or their practices. Why? Because Baal comes from the Tower of Babel era in Babylon. When Nimrod died, he supposedly became a god named Baal. He had an apotheosis to heaven and became a god. Now, that didn't really happen, but that's what the myth is, and that's what Baal worship is about. By the way, the word Baal, Baal, is Hebrew, and its direct translation is Lord. So when they replaced YHWH, Yahuwah, 7,000 times in the Bible, they replaced it with this name many of those times. So this is yet another reference. Four of four of something Yahuwah God conquers, not something he tolerates, nor endorses, nor uses, nor ever intended for his stars to be viewed as. But is this even deeper? Why are we so adamant about this? We introduced this idea in the Three Kings video, part 11 of Solomon's Gold series. But why? Is there another teaching of the stars which we need to watch out for? We offer this scripture from the book of Enoch. We know some scholars try to make a case against this book as a Dead Sea Scroll, although it was in circulation long before the Dead Sea Scrolls were ever found. In fact, it's in the Ethiopian canon of Scripture and has been all along. Or they have a tough time understanding it because they forget Enoch did not die and still lives today, in fact, in the Garden of Eden, which we prove is in Ophir, Havila. Philippines. And if you have not seen our Solomon's Gold series, especially as we uh, make that revelation, you have really missed out. You have got to see this. The book of Jubilees identifies exactly where the Garden of Eden is. But let's look at the book of Enoch 8, 1 through 4. 
And Azazel taught men to make swords and daggers and shields and breastplates. For what? Well, for war. And he showed them the things after these, and the art of making them, bracelets and ornaments, and the art of making up the eyes, and of beautifying the eyelids. See, those things date all the way back to the days of Jared, to the watchers. And the most precious stones and all kinds of colored dyes. And the world was changed. Hmm. And there was great impiety and much fornication, and they went astray. All their ways became corrupt. Well, what was his purpose? He's an evil fallen angel. He wanted to corrupt the earth. That's exactly what he was after. Let's keep reading. A Meserach taught all those who cast spells and cut roots, witchcraft. Armoros, the release of spells, witchcraft. And Barakiel, astrologers, on the same plane as witchcraft. <laughs> and Kokobiel, portents, potions. And Tamiel taught astrology. So you have astrologers, astrology, and Azradel taught the path of the moon. And at the destruction of men, they cried out, and their voices reached heaven. So, Barakiel taught astrologers, and Tamiel taught astrology. This is the historic root of this religion of the Watchers. These are the evil Watcher fallen angels who brought the earth to ruin before the flood in which Yahuwah God restored. There are at least two ancient patterns for interpreting the stars. Yahuwah God makes it clear throughout the word that he uses the sun, moon, and stars as signs and for seasons. And we agree. But are we reading them in his patterns? Or is Revelation 12 being interpreted through the lens of the watcher fallen angels? This passage shows us that evil fallen angels taught a different system for reading and interpreting the stars. But did that disappear as a result of the flood? Jubilees 8, 1 through 4. In the 29th Jubilee, in the first week, in the beginning thereof, our foxad, Shem's son, took to himself a wife, and her name was Rasuya, the daughter of Susan, the daughter of Elam. And she bare him a son in the third year in this week. And he called his name Canem, not Canaan, Canem. And the son grew, and his father taught him writing, and he went to seek for himself a place where he might seize for himself a city. And he found a writing which former generations had carved on the rock. And he read what was thereon, and he transcribed it, and sinned owing to it. For it contained the teachings of the watchers in accordance with which they used to observe the omens of the sun and the moon and the stars in all the signs of heaven. What's that? Astrology. And he wrote it down and said nothing regarding it. For he was afraid to speak to Noah about it, lest he should be angry with him on account of it. There we have it. The root, again, of the teaching of the pagan constellations. Canem found those writings from the watchers, okay, on a stone, and he copied them and hid them from Noah. Key point. Why would he have to hide them from Noah if this was Yahuwah God's way of interpreting the stars in the first place? Well, he wouldn't. And Noah would have no reason to be angry, would he? Yet he knew Noah would. And the topic of this stone was specifically the teachings of the watchers, but which ones? Well, the ones to observe the omens of the sun, the moon, and the stars in all the signs of heaven. This was just before the Tower of Babel. Why is this important? As we saw, Babylon believed in the constellations, and their system was used by Greeks, 
Romans, and Egyptians. It's all the Watcher teachings passed down. Kabbalah is also steeped in this Babylonian astrology, which is its origin and is the teaching of the Watcher fallen angels. See, it permeates our society today, even the church. Ouch. But true. And who carved the stone with the doctrine of the watchers? Former generations. Whose? Well, it seems to imply former generations of Noah, doesn't it? Josephus credits the children of Seth with working to preserve the ancient knowledge in pillars of stone. This stone, though? Because this stone was the teaching of the watchers. Some of the children of Seth in later years definitely followed the Watcher doctrines, though, so, it could be. Not Noah, or Methuselah, or Enoch, or his generations from Adam, which are all named in the Table of Nations. There's no evidence of that. But most of them had multiple children, and some were led astray. Many are not mentioned in the Table of Nations, and perhaps that's why. However, there is no connection we have found that this watcher stone was carved by Seth's generations as far as we can see. It was more likely a giant, and Seth's generations carved other stones. Also, Persian and Arabian traditions ascribe the invention of astronomy to Adam, Seth, and Enoch. Yes, we agree with that. This is astronomy, not astrology. Big difference. Astronomy is the study of stars. Simple. We agree Adam knew the stars. He probably knew many of them by name because Yahuwah taught him. But we object to the interpretation through astrology, which is the religion of the Watchers, which venerates the star constellation gods, as if they actually have some control over your life through horoscopes, for instance. Ever read those, by the way? They are typically so vague, they are meaningless. So, why does all this matter? Because the very system we are being told to use to interpret Revelation 12 on almost all of these online uh, YouTube and, and website uh, dissertations, it's all pretty much the doctrine of the watchers who did not know Yahuwah God's ways. Oh, did I say that? Oh, yes, I did. We'll show you. The book of Enoch 16, 2 and 3. This is Enoch scolding the watchers after he took their petition to Yahuwah God, and this is Yahuwah's response to them. And now to the watcher, fallen angels, who sent you to petition on their behalf, who were formerly in heaven. They left their first estate in Jude. You were in heaven, but its secrets had not yet been revealed to you, and a worthless mystery you knew. This you made known to women in the hardness of your hearts, and through this mystery, the women and the men cause evil to increase on the earth. What's the major harm in this doctrine of the watchers? It's ignorant of the ways of Yahuwah God and absent of his mysteries because the watchers were not in heaven long enough for Yahuwah to reveal its secrets. They don't know them. They are all liars. They are making this stuff up based on false pretenses because they don't know Yahuwah God's secrets. That's the irony of all of this. It's false and it kills, steals, and destroys. And we know where that fruit comes from. Yet, this watcher knowledge is being taught in our school systems. It's in business seminars from self-help gurus. It's coming from Joel Osteen himself and many ministries who teach a more palatable, palatable gospel. You know, the kind that tickles your ears, 
We've been accused of that, as we have uncovered some exciting things, especially for those who live in the Philippines. And the end of this uh, video, or this next video, is going to unveil yet another revelation that blows our mind, because we find the Philippines in Revelation 12, and we'll show. We'll show you. You need to see this. Let's read the rest of the chapter, though, and we'll give you our fresh interpretation as we believe the Holy Spirit has revealed. We admit we have never heard anything like this before. But see, if you agree, and it makes sense, and that it matches Scripture, test and prove it for yourself. But first, let's take a quick look at the constellations being used to propagate the September 23rd interpretation of Revelation 12 using these pagan constellations. Now the rest of this video is our initial take on the September 23rd prophecy as we originally recorded and released it in 2017 before the supposed big coming prophetic event. Nothing happened and there was no event as we predicted, there would be none, because this cannot fit prophecy. Because you cannot interpret prophecy, you cannot interpret scripture through the eyes and the lens of astrology. Our frame of reference, though, is before the event, so you'll hear that in the language. But we chose not to change what we had said, so here it is. Here's a video of Stellarium software showing the constellation Virgo, the woman. The claim is the sun will travel through the constellation, the woman, meaning she is clothed with the sun. However, the sun does not clothe her, as it only passes through her upper portion. The sun is not large enough to clothe her. So, no, this does not qualify as clothed in the sun, in our opinion. But we will show you what does. Also, don't forget, someone connected these dots in the sky to form an image that does not even look like a person, but more so like a crab to us. To then name this as a pagan goddess? No way. The Babylonians, by the way, called this constellation Ishtar. <laughs> which is another name for Semiramis Isis. And Ishtar claims to have traveled to the earth on an egg-shaped meteor, which is still enshrined to this day in Mecca, the center of Islam. It's called the Kaaba Stone. Is that a coincidence? We'll cover it more in the next video. Notice, too, how the star all the way to the left is off of her body. Doesn't that seem odd? I mean, shouldn't it at least somewhat keep her form? Then, the upper star to the right is between her arm and ribs. It's not in her body. Then, what's the one doing heading from her shoulder to her head? We've heard of people having double chins, but does she have an extra neck? Then there's the dislocated hip if it were to reach out to the furthest to the right, where that star is next to her hip. The moon is at the bottom by her foot, uh, but will move under her foot and it does. If we ignore the whole pagan constellation part, this actually fits, sort of. Well, that depends on the size of her feet, of course, as she was a giant goddess, after all. Oh, yeah, we forgot to mention one of the three faraway supposed planets within Virgo's constellation is actually titled the Seventy Virgins. Now, where have we heard that before? Well, from ISIS, Islam, right? If they 
commit jihad, they go to heaven and get 70 virgins, right? Hmm. Anyway, wasn't Isis the moon goddess, by the way? Uh, yes, she was. And wasn't Allah also a moon god? Uh, yes, and we'll prove this and cover it in detail in the next video with sources. Sounds more like this constellation is covered in moon references to us. Here is a still of the actual frame we see over and over online. See the sun about to enter Virgo? The moon at her feet, Leo is over her head. This is a once in 7,000 year event, one site says. Is it? Because the guy propagating this online with 8 million views, probably more by the time you watch this video, admits he predicted the same thing to happen in 2015, just two years ago. Um, maybe not once in a lifetime. He was wrong that time, but he must be right this time. Uh, nuh uh. So let's break this down. The purple arrow to the left is the moon, the red, is Jupiter, the king planet, which will enter the womb of Virgo supposedly for nine months. Oh, wait a minute. Jupiter is the name of a pagan god. He is not a child either. So does this fit? Oh, and the woman who appears in heaven is already nine months pregnant when she appeared, and she birthed the child a few verses in. So no, this does not fit. But he is a king, so that part could fit if one wishes to interpret the Bible through pagan goggles. And look, they show nine stars in Leo. The green arrows and three planets happen to move into that star field uh, on September 23rd, making it 12 stars. So that's it, the 12 stars in her head. This must be right. Leo the lion. Lion means king, right? It sure could, but what it does not mean is crown. But here's how much of a stretch this is. The distance between Leo and Virgo is light years apart. And how many stars do you count in Leo? Way more than nine and more than 12. There are at least 20 just in the form of the lion's body here, no less. Does that fit the prophecy? No, it doesn't. See, it all depends on how you draw her with these lines. This is the same Stellarium software some are using to find the Star of Bethlehem which would have had to have traveled west for two years, then changed directions two times in the course of about a couple of hours. No star does that, and Stellarium does not show that. The star of Bethlehem was an angel, and you will not find it using Stellarium software. Finally, there is a sort of alignment going on in the sky, right? However, that too depends on what you call an alignment, because these planets are not in a straight line. They are still far from each other in terms of alignment. Additionally, you will never notice this in the sky. This whole story plays out in a software program called Stellarium, not the real world. This is not even something we can observe and any one of these lines could be drawn differently. The reason astrology is still around after all these years is because it is a religion that started after the flood in Babylon but really originates from the watcher fallen angels from the days of Jared in early Genesis. And we are still dealing with this even in the church. So did the rapture happen September 23rd, 2017? No. We're still here, aren't we? And so is pretty much everyone else. So, nope. Did the Great Tribulation start in 2017? Uh, no. This was a 
Khan, and those who came up with it, wrong again, and though that's at least twice for the one guy, some still even listen to these guys. Amazing. Again, we have fallen for different such moves over the years. I remember the Shemitah prophecy that seemed so compelling and everything seemed to tie so well. There are many such contrived prophecy interpretations, and when you break them down, they leave Scripture, either painting part of it as allegory or even reading it and then going on and ignoring what it says completely, or applying some Talmudic or other occult principle in order to arrive at, well, in this case, basically blaming Yahuwah for 9-11, which is ludicrous. That's what the Shemitah theory did, and we didn't see that the first time. We are all much more easily deceived when we don't know the word and we don't test everything we hear with Scripture. A lot of things sound good, but if it doesn't fit Scripture, throw it out, as it is just ear-tickling doctrine. Prophecy is not determined by a software program, nor Bible code, which is really numerology, not Scripture, and also found in Kabbalah, same source, Babylon. We need to wake up to these things because they are intended to deceive, to cause unnecessary fear and panic, to condition us for false conditions, uh, false flags, for instance. So how do we read this? We, though, thought you would never ask. And we are going to lay out our interpretation of Revelation 12 in the next videos, which are coming right after this one. We have expanded our research beyond the original release, and though some still will attempt to naysay, which is fine, challenges are okay with us, but debating us without watching is not. See if they can prove this wrong. That's the real question. This progressing revelation is really monumental, and because biblical geography has been restored in these instances. Prophecy begins to fill in needed gaps for full understanding, or at least a lot closer than we had before. Just as the first clip we showed you, better fasten your hat tightly, because this will blow your mind and it's coming soon after this one. Thank you for watching our Solomon's Gold series. Please share this video with others and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click the bell, and check out our website at thegodculture.com. Always remember to prove all things for yourself. Yahuwah God bless.